Welcome to Truth and Grace with John and Mark. In this podcast, we tackle difficult issues related to living, loving, and leading in a broken world. We hope you are encouraged by today's episode. Welcome back to Truth and Grace with John and Mark. We're always glad you're here, and I'm always happy to be with my buddy, John Bailey. How you doing, man? I am doing great. I am all fired up for today. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just came back from San Diego. Um, you know, I think most people would assume that, you know, we're, there's a lag time between the time we record and the time yep. the podcast is broadcast. This this is late February. Yeah. Um, it is snowing heavy outside yep. here in Colorado Springs, but we just came back from San Diego where it was, you know, they said they had a cold front and it was like temperatures in the high fifties. And I'm like, clearly your definition of a cold front is different than mine. <laughs> no, it changes everything when you live in Colorado, you go it places does. and like, I wear a t-shirt and it's like 50 degrees outside and people are freezing. I'm like, really? This is kind of just normal. <laughs> yeah. So we were in San Diego for the World Challenge Fire in Our Bones Pastors Conference. Yep. Um, several hundred pastors and church leaders were there. It was absolutely amazing. Yep. It was about 600. I have been um, going to World Challenge conferences even before I, I was on staff here. Mm-hmm. I was at a church. So about 12 years, and I've probably been to 20 of them. It was it was by far, to me, the best World Challenge conference that I've been at in America. And, you know, pastors were so encouraged. Mm. There was just, I mean, such a powerful work of the Holy Spirit in the place. It was great. There was, I, I you know, the, the preaching was good. I loved the worship. Amen. Yep. There was so much diversity yep. on the platform, you know, where we had basically a rap R&B group that was leading worship part of the time. Yeah. That was amazing. Amazing. And uh just love that, you know. Um I, I may have lost a little bit of hearing. <laughs> <laughs> it was loud. <laughs> and I was positioned right in front of the yeah. the the uh speaker stand and my watch kept going you are being exposed to high levels of <laughs> <laughs> yeah and we, we felt a little old didn't we <laughs> we did indeed but it was fun it was great yeah. uh, we have people on staff here at world challenge that help lead worship and they did a great job yeah um and Shane and Shane Shane and Shane came in man that was Shh. you know I I tend to listen to their music yeah. personally yeah. and um but had no idea what they would do as yeah. you know as like leading in worship because yeah. right? it's like you know part of me was like I I know they could do a concert, but that's not really what this is. This is different. This is leading worship. For pastors and leaders. For pastors and leaders. And they did a phenomenal job, man. I I love what they said. They said, we plagiarized from God (laughs) because they just go to the Bible and then they sing scriptures. And it was just just so powerful. It It really aligns, too, with World Challenge and who we are and kind of what the ministry is about. Indeed. And, you know, so many tremendous um, messages I'm going to I'm going to ask you in a moment to give what you what was your maybe your favorite message or at least some highlights from it. I'm just going to tell you up front and I am not John knows me well enough to know I am not a suck up. My favorite message at the entire conference was your message. Oh well. I think you just, you know, I heard you preach several times, but that one was by far I thought the best message and I thought it was prophetic. Yeah. And I'm I don't use that word very often. Because I think he gets overused, but I think it was really a prophetic word to pastors yeah. about where we're walking into culturally. Yep. And yet that should not cause us to shrink back whatsoever. The 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 more sin abounds, the more grace abounds. And so That's you right. just you just hammered it. And I was it was it was great. Well, thank you, and I, I'm humbled by that, and I, I you're not a flatter. Uh, actually, Mark Rinsel was put on, uh, came to World Challenge to keep me humble, and so, no, for you to say that, it really does mean a lot. And if you ask me, like, man, Pastor Carter Conlon did two uh, two messages on New Covenant that was powerful, and Tim Delina on his message with Scars was oh. just just powerful. It, really, every message that came forward, it just there was just a, a you know, just a red cord that just kind of went through all of it. Sure. It was the cross. It was Jesus 
we need an awakening. When, when one of the things when I came to World Challenge was like, we need a move of God. And I really saw that. Mm-hmm. What I saw at that conference was pastors and leaders that are hungry for more of God in the days that we live. And we we need an awakening in America. Absolutely. So, well, that takes us to a great uh, transition because you just talked about you wanted to see a revival or we want to see an awakening. And we definitely need that in America. And around the world. And around the world. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and late February now, uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've been seeing that God seems to be doing something unique mm-hmm. at Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky. Yep. And, um, you know, by the time this podcast airs, we don't know what the status of that is going to be. Um, but we want to talk, use that as a catalyst to talk about the whole subject of revival and renewal. So maybe just to start with, what's your general take on revival, renewal, you know, these various terms that are used for this type of thing? Yeah. Well, the first thing is revival. Um, you know, I, I was a missionary in Ireland, which you know that. Um, Ireland is the only English-speaking country in the world that was not touched by the Reformation. Mm-hmm. So even when, when I went there, there was 50 preaching points. That's And that when I say that's a home Bible study or a church, there's maybe only three churches that were owned uh, by a, a church, three facilities owned by a church in all of Ireland. So, it, you know, that that's kind of the stats of the church. So, man, now the church, it's flourishing in Ireland. Churches mm-hmm. are being planted. Churches have grown. God has done a great work in there. But you can't really say that's a revival because it's just God moving in yeah, an unreached sure. area. Yeah. Whereas revival to me is reviving something that has become dead. You know, and you mm-hmm. had that in the Old Testament right. where, the you know, Israel would have this spiritual awakening. And they they had the scriptures. They knew who God was, but that it, but the but the that that fervency to serve God had had dropped to a low level. And I think that what we are facing in America is that the fervency for the things of God. Just just a really quick thing. Uh, Twenty five years ago, the average Christian went to church twice a week. Mm. Now the average Christian goes to church, and that's like people that regularly attend twice a month. Mm. That's a that's a that's a big shift. Sure. And so the fervency for the things of God, church, evangelism is at a low place. So to me, a, a spiritual revival, renewing or awakening is when people start going, hey, not only do I believe in God, but I want to move out in faith and seek God and see him move in my life and the world around me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I grew up in a uh church culture where we would have scheduled mm-hmm. revival meetings. <laughs> <laughs> There's something that's almost like uh, oxymoronical about that, you know, scheduled revival. Really what we had was we had revivalistic meetings or evangelistic meetings or, you know, they, they I, I understand, I, you know, I, I'm not trying to bash that i'm just saying that certainly that's different than what we're talking about right you know when we talk about revival we're talking about that god meets with his people Mm -hmm. and out of that comes some common characteristics you know for me i think of a greater awareness of his presence absolutely a greater gravity of God's holiness. And Mm -hmm. when that happens, there's always a resulting uh, gravity of my sinfulness. Yeah. You know, the more I understand God is holy, the more I understand that I'm sinful. And, And a proper understanding of that doesn't lead me to woe is me It it does lead me to a woe is me. That's what we see in Isaiah Mm six, but that it, it brings me to God. It doesn't bring me to a woe is me. I have no hope. It's woe is me. I have no hope in myself, but God is great and he is drawing me to himself. Those are two for me too common. And I think there's also a sense of uh, usually there is there is associated with them is a, is greater worship. Yep. And a lot of times new <clears throat> Even on the creative side, new songs tend to, tend to come out yeah. of revival times. Yeah, you highlighted something that's really important, though, because the initial part of revival isn't what you do. 
but it's the internal work that God does inside of yes. me. It's that awakening to like, hey, I need more of Jesus in my life. I need to repent of my sins. I need to turn to God. I've become very shallow in my faith. It's that inward work. And then when the Lord does that inward work, then all of the the, the seeking God and worship and those other things begin to happen because like Jesus said, the inside of the cup gets clean. And now if the inside of the cup gets clean, the outward work of that will go in a lot of different directions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so from your perspective, what are some traits of revival? Yeah, you know, for for the sake of, of this talk, I want to maybe, maybe kind of put in three categories with revival. Sounds good. I think that there's pseudo revival mm-hmm. where you go, it's not really God, it's not really the Holy Spirit, it's not really a Christian revival. Mm-hmm. I think that that's one thing that we can talk about. The second thing I would want to talk about is is sometimes revivals start off really pure and then they they kind of turn to where it, it no longer is uh, really biblical, turns in, into carnal or fleshly. And then there's those types of revivals. And then the third one, which is I think is what we, we all crave and desire, is a true biblical renewal that's God's way filled with the Holy Spirit that has a really uh, divine work that lasts for a long time. Because if all a revival is, is an emotional stirring for a few months, um, that's really not, to me, that's not really a biblical revival. Yeah, I mean, if there's not a an outward expression of this, and I don't mm-hmm. just mean, okay, yes, I'm living more aware of God's presence. Yeah. But I, for me, and maybe this is me bringing my act missional activism here <laughs> but i don't think i'm exaggerating you know yeah. jesus said go wait in Jer- jerusalem until the power of the holy spirit comes cuz you're going to need it mm-hmm. because i have a global plan for you that's going to mean taking the gospel to every people on the face of the earth and you're not going to be able to do that in your own power i mean the ultimate first new testament revival yep was about Taking the go- empowerment for spreading the gospel. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit moves. Yes. Then you have the preaching of God's word. There's repentance yep. because the repentance says, tell us what we need to do. do. How to, what do I need <laughs> sure. to do to be right with you? Yep. And, and then you have 3,000 people get saved. And they take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Yep. That's really, that's, I mean, if you're, if you're looking at to define a biblical renewal, you have the prayer, the worship, the unity, all of these things, really, that's a great way to look at what a, what a spiritual revival or renewal should look like. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, so let's just go ahead and jump into number one, which may be <laughs> the most difficult one in one sense, because, yeah. you know, pseudo revival. So obviously we're talking about false revivals, things that get called revival. Um, and could, could I say this? It doesn't mean that the people that are involved are not believers. I don't think that we ever judge that. That's not but our you place. Can't, but what it yes. says, but you do judge the the fruit. Yes. You judge what happens more so than judging the people that are involved. Yes. And 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 from, uh, you know, a lot of the people who watch our podcast or listen to it online, you know, are ministry leaders. Yep. And, you know, one of the things that I have a strong conviction of is that as a pastor, Mm -hmm. you actually have the responsibility of stewarding that relationship with your people, with your flock. And part of that means guarding them from wolves and false shepherds. And I think that's so when we're talking about pseudo revival, part of what we're talking about is the nature of that, but we're also we're, we're doing it for the purpose mm-hmm. of helping pastors and church leaders and people in the pew to discern, is this a move of God? So Yeah, I'll give you a quick story with that. It kind of highlights this. So I have a really close friend that pastors, and most of you that are watching know that I've pastored over the years. And so there was a revival that came to Florida. And uh, in the revival, the, the person that started just literally started by saying, I'm not here about repentance. I'm not here about salvation. I'm here for miracles. He had a 14-foot angel that gave him a word, you know, and then everything was about miracles. It really sounds like Mormonism. I I mean, it was was really – so, like, I mean, the first words that I hear from his mouth is, you know, this is about miracles. 
And I listen, we believe in miracles, and I thank God for healing. But uh, listen, the, the bedrock of any ministry is not miracles. These things follow, the right. miracles follow the preaching of the word. And so as immediately the discernment was like, hey, and it wound up, I mean, completely falling apart. They found out the leader was an adultery. It was a, it really uh, felt, well, I had a friend that was pastoring and he said, man, I got it right. He said, I didn't speak for it and I didn't speak against it. So the people who were a part of it, they, you know, they all came back to the church and never lost anybody. And I said, well, here's what you missed. If you would have spoken and said, hey, this doesn't line up with the word. Yeah, some people would have left the church, but they would have come back. And everybody that came back and everybody was there would have known my pastor has discernment to be able to look and see what's true and what lines up with what, what's God's word. And it's not. And so, and I said it to him kindly because we're friends. Sure. But I said, I think you missed it, actually. <laughs> so discernment is really important. And for leaders, it's important for us to know what lines up with Scripture. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And now, most a lot of these pseudo-revivals have attached to them what they would call signs and wonders yes. that are sometimes, and, and, and you, yeah. you know, we, we, I've acknowledged in this podcast before, culturally, I tend to be quite conservative. Um, you know, so I, I don't tend to go to loud and, you know, demonstrable type places for worship. And I love loud and I love demonstrable. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, we are the odd couple here. Um, but with that said, um, you know, I'm always careful. I don't want to even even in our prayer time before this in before we recorded today yep you know we we prayed specifically that we would handle this subject carefully yep you know because not neither one of us ever want to attribute something to god that is not of god nor do we want to claim that something is not of god that might be of God. We want to approach things with both as well, grace and truth. Yeah. Well, and faith. I, I mean, I want anybody that's watching to know, I mean, just as a bedrock of where we start, we believe God can do anything. I have, I mean, I literally have, have been in a place where we've prayed for somebody who was blind mm -hmm. and God opened their eyes and they had the, per, the man had a seen eye dog. The next week he gave the seen eye dog Back to, to the people that somebody else needs us because I don't need it anymore. Right. I've seen God, I mean, heal backs and necks and cancer. And I completely believe in the miraculous and the supernatural. But it also needs to line up with God's word. And if and if we if we just go, hey, if it's a miracle and it doesn't matter if it lines up with the word or not, I think that's a dangerous place. Well, if Christ is not exalted as king of the universe, yep. <laughs> if he is not exalted as the risen son of God, if the Trinity yep. in all of its fullness is not exalted, it's a pseudo revival. Well, I have no problem saying that. Well, and Paul says, I mean, this is the, this, you know, the person saying that this isn't about salvation and repentance. Yes. The uh, apostle Paul says, I determined to know nothing among you except for Christ and him crucified. Yep. Well, so now, like, if, when you start to depart from that very far, doesn't mean that every message has to, you know, can't be on the Holy Spirit or other things. But that has to be the bedrock of any message and any revival movement. If it is not Christ and Him crucified, it should alarm bells should be going off in our minds and going, "Hey, is this really lined up with God's word?" Yeah, and you know, some people would argue that, well, you know, we should just let time, you know, determine whether or not this was you know, appropriate or not. Gamaliel. Yeah. The yeah Bible, you yeah. know, but Paul didn't seem to have that conviction. I mean, when he wrote the book of Galatians, now, of course, he was contending for the real gospel, mm -hmm. but he said, if, if an angel yeah. preaches to you a different gospel, you yeah. know, that oh, he even said, if I come, I come back, back. <laughs> if I come back in a year and I preach another gospel, let me be a curse. Yes. So that's, those are powerful words. Yeah. So that's anything that. that does not for me, one of the most central pieces is, is Jesus glorified? Amen. Is the the glory and the holiness of God lifted up? Yeah. You know, if not, 
apart from whatever signs. And, and for me, I would put, I would say that one of the key signs of a pseudo revival is that more emphasis is placed upon what would be described as the signs of God rather than the person of God. Yeah. And the folk, it doesn't mean that necessarily less miracles happen. You see in the New Testament, you know, where, you know, you know, where, where, you know, the shadow yeah, of sure. Peter walks by and people are healed. Paul, so yeah, pieces of tents, hang- hang- <laughs> handkerchiefs, no, handkerchiefs yeah, exactly. And so, so I, I do want to make sure that everybody that's watching knows today we're giving a whole lot of width to what that looks like, and especially because both of us have been missionaries. So there can be a context in places around the world where we see Christ being honored and glorified that may not look like it does in America at a you know church with a steeple on the top of it. You know, it could be in home fellowships or house churches. So revival has a lot of different ways to be expressed. But the core aspect has to be that the attention is on Christ, the sacrifice that he made and the work that he does in our life, and then the power of the Holy Spirit to make that alive and real. So, right? yes. So let me just ask a Tough question here. Here it comes. <laughs> yeah, here it comes. And whether you, you want to make a statement on this, but you know, some of some revivals that have come out in the last 30 years, let's just yeah. go back that far, have had associated with them some. I'm gonna I want to be real careful here, but I don't know another word except bizarre. All right, just say it, Mark. Bizarre. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bizarre is the word. Bizarre yeah. quote unquote manifestations associated with them. Yeah. Um I, I know where I land on that. Um how do how do we discern whether or not these sorts of demonstrations are from God or not? Well, I, I mean, here's one when you talk about bizarre. So Jesus spits in dirt, he makes a ball of mud and sticks it in a guy's eye. Yes. That that's about as bizarre as anything that, that you would you would see. So, you know, I, I I, I, I'm a little bit careful in going, okay, just because something is unconventional doesn't mean that it's not the Holy Spirit. But there's some time where people are punching people in the stomach. And, you know, it, it can it can breach over to places that it's more about the spectacular. Well, you, and I think that the way you can know that is by sitting there and having the discernment to go, hey, is, is all of this just, uh, you know, like, you know, something to keep people's attention that's a, the— spectacular, or are we really bringing the focus on the work that Jesus does through the Holy Spirit? Sure. I think of two things related to what you just said. One is, you know, it's uh, sometimes it's we started with the Spirit and we have moved to the flesh. Yes. And that's our second point we'll deal with more today. But also, I think there's, you know, so you mentioned the example of um, Jesus with the, you know, mud, spitting in the mud. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, other places he spits on his fingers, touches a guy's tongue. You know, the we talked about earlier, the handkerchiefs of Paul, yeah. Peter, the shadows. But we never see those turned into normative expressions. <laughs> right. Pa- Peter never says in his two epistles, you know, what you really need to do is remember that your shadow is where the power lies. Right. Now, every time you walk by and it becomes your shadow. Yes. And now we're going to, which is what happens now. People make handkerchiefs. And if you send me, (laughs) you know, $25, I'll send you a handkerchief that's anointed. And it's, you know, not now you're making it a normative expression of the church. Even in the New Testament, we don't see one example and we don't have in church history an example of the early apostles thinking, well, spirit, spit and mud were became, became the tools used for healing. So the whole point being there is if we're not careful, we can take what God might do in a moment in a particular person's life, mm-hmm. and it might become, um, we, we should be careful about trying to make it normative. We, we talk about these signs and wonders. Mm-hmm. So um, barking like an animal. Gold fill, you know, fillings turned into gold. Right. Um, gold dust, quote unquote, falling from the sky. Um, I could give a longer, you know, a much longer list of, sure. you know, roaring like lions, whatever. Um, w- where do you land on these types of issues? 
Yeah, first of all, I think that when it comes to animals and you're like you're personifying animals, I would be really, really cautious about that. I don't there's nothing in scripture. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of really false religions that do those sorts of things. I would be really careful about clucking. I, hey, I, I've, I've told you this story before. I was at a, at a church uh, overseas, and the worship leader is just clucking like a chicken, you know, like roosting like a chicken. And I'm like, yeah, I don't, you know, it, you know, so I, I, I would be really cautious. And I, but I, I would put this context though, and I think it's really good to do this, Mark. Is yeah, some sometimes just because something is different doesn't mean that it's not God. But if when you start to look at the whole of it, and you go, uh, like there, there was a revival that was a laughing revival. Now, do I think that the Holy Spirit can make you laugh? But when everything is known by laughing. It's just not a biblical manifestation. Right. So now you're now now it's not just a person laughed. Maybe that was genuine at some point and place. But then when it becomes this normative thing, and now we're known as the laughing revival, now we've we've taken something that really should be Christ centered and we've moved it into another area. My opinion on that would be as you look and you discern and you go, is really the things that are happening here, is it really pointing us towards Jesus? Or is it something that's spectacular that draws the attention of, of people to, and then that's what the core uh, message becomes? I think that that would be a dangerous thing. The purpose of signs and wonders were always to point to Jesus and point to the gospel, not to point to the signs and wonders. 100%. Yeah. Let's move ahead and go into the second revival mode, which is the ones that start well and don't end well. In my opinion, this is probably the biggest sector yep. of of revival movements is they start well, but they don't always end well. Has that been your experience? Um I don't I don't I mean I I think that there's so many like you there's times where there's revival awakenings. Like if you go to the you know, uh, you know, Jonathan Edwards. Sure, first, there was a, first great awakening. Yeah, it was an incredible awakening across America. But I don't think everything has to touch all of America. Uh, their communities can have a spiritual awakening. What's happening in Asbury? I know that there's people that are detractors from that. I see that God's doing something really pure there. You got college students. You don't have anybody that's like the name of the person that's leading the revival. Right. It really seems Christ-centered, young people seeking God and praying. And so it feel it feels to me like, and I used to, I, I told you, that mm-hmm. I lived in Wilmore, Kentucky for a year. Right. I did my college internship in Frankfurt. So I was right across the street from the university and have been there so many times. These are good people that love God. Sure. So when people that are detractors to that, I think this is a genuine touch of God by college students. It, I think it's powerful. But I think that the, then the caution becomes, where, where, where does this lead you to? And I think that there have been movements that were about repentance and seeking God and prayer and turning to the Lord and sharing your faith. And then when it come, becomes about a lot of other things, there has been revival movements uh, in America that started off really good. And by the end of it, the leaders don't talk to each other. Yeah. There's massive debt that takes place. Uh, you know, the, the leaders walk away millionaires while the church is suffering. And then you go, where, where is everybody at? Right. Uh, I, went to, I went to one that was a, a, a revival in Lakeland and church, 10,000 people in the church. And it was packed out for months. Within five years, there was 200 people in the back chapel, mm. and they literally took brick by brick and tore the whole church down. Mm. It, you know, and you look at that and you go, I, I think that there was probably something that started off well, but by the end of it, uh, it doesn't look like really a New Testament awakening. Yeah. You know, I remember from a positive perspective, um, I remember I went— before we went overseas, I went to the Brownsville Revival. Yep. Just like so many others, heard about it, went to see what was happening. Yep. Um, the one thing I got fr- I got from the event or going for the conference, I think I was, or the revival, I think I was there two or three days. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, they had just evening services. And I remember going. And the one thing that stuck in my head so strongly was 
people were showing up with a, a, an expectation yeah. that God was going to show up there. I remember the day I was there, some people had come from like Australia. Yeah. I mean, they literally had gone from one side of the world to the other just you know, to see what God was doing. And and I, I would assume with more than just curiosity, yep. they wanted to meet God in some unique way while there. And I just remember thinking to myself, while this may be good, maybe I, I wasn't even really evaluating that. I was thinking to myself, if the most of us showed up at our church on Sunday morning, mm-hmm. the, let's be frank, if the speaker, if the pastor showed up on Sunday morning, that's right. With the same sense of anticipation. And with the fire and yeah. you know, just ready to seek after God. God, yeah. exactly. That God's going to show up and meet us here today. It, it Revivals would probably be less centralized and way more decentralized because they'd be happening all over the world. Yeah. And it's, and it's a good thing that you brought up, Browns. But one thing I would, uh, maybe you're watching Man, give us a comment if you have an experience there or there's some people that just completely against it. Other people would, you know, like would nearly like a salvation experience and had really great things that happened there. I I went probably five or six times Mm. and I will tell you my experience and you can take it or leave it if you're watching. Hopefully, you know, it can bring some wisdom. But the first couple of times I went. I've, there was a really pure move. I was a youth pastor at the time. I, I took 60 teenagers to Brownsville, mm. and there was a really—it was about worship. It was about prayer. When Steve Hill preached, it was on repentance, repentance. and mm. turning to God, and people were getting saved. And my first—the first couple of times that I went, mm-hmm. it was powerful. I, I had a powerful effect mm-hmm. of, of God touching my life. I would say as well, the last couple of times that I went, the things that I saw— were like they would have people come up for prayer. And I didn't see this this at the beginning, but people that wanted prayer, they wanted this leader or that leader to pray for them. So they mm. nearly would push people out of the way. If I could just get the leader to pray mm. for me. And I and I and I was like, you know, this change from the focus being about Christ to about if I could get that man to pray for me or this man to pray for me. And it really, it really had the opposite effect. I was like, you know, once it starts to become about the speaker or the name or the person, and it's not about what God is doing, I think that it, it can really tarnish uh, what I think started off as great. And I think one of the things that I really loved about Brownsville was Steve Hill was, he preached repentance, turn to God and turn away from sin and you need Jesus in your life and he'll change your life. It was powerful. So yeah, sure. I don't know if you had any other experiences that you saw there or um, things that maybe you walked away with. No, that was really, for me, that was it. But I remember, you know, like you said, I've, I know people mm-hmm. who have ha- had a very positive experience there. And most of them would say it was a catalyst yeah. in their life. Mm-hmm. It wasn't that God did some final work. Yep. It was that. And for me, that's where I tend to line up where revivals are key, is that they are catalyst to what God wants to do in us individually and in the church and in the world in an ongoing way. Because we can't live in that context every day. Yeah. I mean, we've we've been talking about Asbury at some point. Kids have to go back to school. <laughs> Take a test. <laughs> yeah, you know, parents are going to go, I'm glad you really had that experience, but I'm not paying, you know, X number of dollars a year, right. you know, for and you to you do, know just do paper, this. Right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You're there to get an education. Yeah. So at some point, this is going to become, but what do they do with that? Yeah. So what I mean by that is that touch of God that they're experiencing, I hope will be something that they will be able to look back to as a signpost in their life. It's a, it's the old Testament version of you put up a pillar of rocks to remind us so that hopefully generations from now, those students who are there will tell their kids and their grandkids of God showed up. Yeah. God transformed my life. I was thinking about, 
you know, my future and it was all about me. And in that context, God made me understand it was all about him and that my whole perspective on life changed. If that's what comes out of it, that's a real revival for me. Yeah, no, it really, and you can't, you can't really gauge the movement on what happens with individuals. I, you know, there was years and years ago that I had a favorite evangelist and it wound up that, you know, he was in sin and whatever. And I was like, man, I really like that guy. And, uh, you know, the Lord really spoke this because the guy spoke the word of God mm-hmm. and I, and what God did in my work and my life was through the word and the Holy Spirit. So, you know, irrespective of what that man was doing or not doing, the Lord did a work in my heart. Sure. So, you know, remi- revival movements can, you know, it's a movement, but all of that is really what happens individually in a life. And I think the one thing that I would say is, you know, God wants us to, you know, our call as the church is to make disciples. So if a revival movement, if Asbury causes you to seek God and then love your neighbor and then love people that despitefully use you, and it provokes you to go to an unreached people group in the Middle East, or, or it provokes you to go to inner city America, yeah. or to your neighbor that doesn't know Jesus, and that's the response that comes out of it. Now I go, that's the Holy Spirit working because the 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 purpose of a revival isn't to go, oh, a lot of people showed up at a church. It's to really transform the lives so that the work of the Holy Spirit conforms us to the image of Christ so that we become more and more like Jesus. Yes, and our values are changed and all of those our things. Our worldview changes. Yes. I, I, heard, I heard somebody say this last week that said 41% of pastors in America have a true biblical worldview. Isn't that sad? I, I was like, 41%? We need to awaken man, to God's Word and the work of the Holy Spirit. We got to awaken to that in the church. And so if a revival movement causes you to get back to God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit, then praise God. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're, we're wrapping this up, this episode up. I think both of us would agree that America— and, 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 you know, I lived overseas. I have a, a strong affection for other countries of the world also, but this is my homeland. Amen. And, you know, I, from a jealousy perspective, I want to see God do a move in this land. You know, I don't want to return to anything. Yeah. I'm not trying to go back to the 1950s, <laughs> you know, cause quite frankly, if I was black, I wouldn't have thought the 1950s were that great. And living in the Bible Belt. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, being a Christian wasn't really a great thing. It wasn't. Was it? Exactly. Yeah. No. You got to be honest with yeah, that. Yeah, so I'm not talking about returning to anything except returning to God. The heart of Jesus. Jesus. Amen. I want to see Jesus exalted in the church. I want to see Jesus exalted in his people. And mm. I want to see Jesus exalted in in the streets. Come on. In public pro- proclamation and in daily living by God's people. And so if that happens, that's a revival for me. And you know what I love about World Challenge? If This is not an infomercial or anything. That is what we're about. And when I'm with Mark Renfro and we're not in front of a video camera and I'm with Gary Wilkerson and I'm with Joshua West, we're not, you know, there's a purity of heart that wants to seek God and see God move and transform America and transform the world. And it, hey, church, it's time to rise. Yeah. So if if you know a bunch of college students causes you to go, hey, I want to pray more fervently and believe God and witness to my neighbor, we need an awakening of the Holy Spirit and in Wilmore, Kentucky, and we need it in Dallas and San Diego and Los Angeles and New York City and across America. Yeah. Yeah. Well, John, I think it's time for us to pray. Amen. And uh, if it's okay with you, I'm going to pray. Please do. And I'm just going to close this out, and um, I'm going to pray that God would actually send revival. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Lord, we love you today. Oh, God, we love you. We're so desperate for you. Thank you, God. Uh, We acknowledge our nation needs you. Lord, we're not trying to see Jesus established in political power. We're trying to see Jesus established in the hearts and the lives of his people. Lord, in my own life, I want to see revival happen like never before. Mm. I want to have a hunger for you that has never existed, Lord, that superseded. Lord, I feel like I'm in a 
a place that's maybe stronger than I've ever been spiritually. I don't want to plateau there. Lord, this isn't about uh, trying to have more Thank of you, anything. It's about being closer in fellowship yes, with Lord. you. Lord, I want to hear your voice. I want to do what you say. I want to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. When I step into a place of ministry and pulpits, when God opens up the door for me to preach, I want to preach with a holy power and a holy uh, anointing, Lord, that speaks your word with power. Lord, I know that there are men and women listening to this who echo Jesus. that prayer. Lord, we pray Thank for you, the God. people in our churches. For, Lord, if you don't do a work, Lord, families are going to come apart. Yes, God. Lord, churches are going to dry up and die. Lord, we need a work of God in our families, in our homes, in our church, in our nation. So, Lord, today we ask for that. We ask that the power of the Holy Spirit would show up. Lord, this coming Sunday, people are going to get ready. They're going to meet in churches across this nation. Lord, we pray that you would surprise us with your presence. Mm. Lord, we're not trying to, we're not looking for anything other than all of you. Jesus. And so, Lord, regardless of tradition, regardless of denomination, Lord, we just ask that Jesus show up. Lord, mm-hmm. would you show up in the power of the Spirit so that God would be exalted? Lord, we ask these things in your name. Amen. 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 You know, Mark, I, I, I don't, I've never done this, but I just want to ask you, you know, can, can next week, can we talk about what it means to walk in the fire of God. Yeah. A lot sure. of people talk about fire of God. And I think here we try to be really transparent and we're not religious people. But when it talks about the fire came upon them, what does it mean to be people that carry the fire of God? Can we talk about yeah, that next week? Absolutely. We'll do that. So you just heard what we're going to talk about <laughs> next week. So join us. I think it'll be a value to you. In the meantime, Please, we ask that you would share the content with people that you think would benefit from it on YouTube, make a comment, use on the podcast, share it with your friends, uh, whatever way you have of getting this message out. We'd be grateful to you. We're always thankful that you join us as the third member in this conversation. We value your time and we are just so thankful that you're part of the Truth and Grace family. God bless. Thanks so much for joining us. We know your time is valuable, and we're so thankful you chose to spend it with us. If you want more encouragement, we'd recommend Gary Wilkerson's special series and study guide on the Psalms called The Generation That Seeks the Lord. You can find it at worldchallenge.org, or you can get more information in the show notes. John and Mark will be back next week to offer their insight into how believers can live, love, and lead well in a broken world. We'll see you next time.